these animals have been left behind in modern agriculture's big race, the continual quest for greater production. These are Tamworth pigs. There's a few Wessex saddlebacks here as well. They're the black and white ones. The future existence of both breeds in Australia is uncertain. Back in the 60s, they were actually a premium bacon pig in Australia and their, their registered numbers were over 1,600. And at around the same time, Landrace and some of the white breeds came to Australia and also pigs went indoors. And so basically these old breeds, which had thrived and done really well, um, usually as part of a dairy farm, they lost favour way back then. Katie Brown began gathering the fast diminishing remnants of the breed more than 20 years ago. This is not only the largest herd of Tamworths in the country, it's one of the few. The breed's survival in Australia relies on just a few dedicated growers. She's part of a network of livestock owners around the country who raise rare breeds. I'm an accidental pig farmer. It happened by accident. I didn't set out to collect Tamworths. <laughs> As an island, Australia is fortunately free of many livestock diseases that are endemic overseas, like African swine flu, which has killed untold pigs in countries such as China. But it also leaves us genetically landlocked. It's very difficult to import fresh genetics because of the risk of importing disease, and that leaves rare breeds at risk of dying out. We need to save the genetic material because in the future these breeds might offer things that we're going to lose. Each breed has different traits and, and things that make them unique. They can graze, they have their babies outdoors, people want to see more animals kept in more natural ways and the old breeds are all more thrifty and do this much better. But these pigs don't suit modern farming, namely large-scale intensive indoor piggeries. And that's true of a wide range of rare livestock. You know, like a whole range of animals that all basically are for food production, fibre production, or to work a farm. Globally, there's a mind-boggling variety of livestock. About a thousand breeds of cattle, roughly the same number of sheep, some 200 different horse breeds. But worldwide, the list is shrinking. They estimate that between one and three breeds be, uh, become extinct every month. So how can Australia protect its priceless livestock? There is a scientific solution, a National Livestock Gene Bank, where genetic material could be stored and preserved by cryogenic freezing. You really need to have a combination of semen and embryos, and I think it can be done. Um, I think we just need the motivation to for it to, to happen. This high-tech Noah's Ark has been talked about for several decades. In 2020, then Federal Agriculture Minister David Littleproud promised the Coalition would build a livestock and pasture gene bank, a pledge renewed this year, if the Coalition was re-elected, which of course didn't happen. I think we've got to pressure the, the new government to, to do the same. Suddenly, there's a new urgency. I think it's very vital, Tim, uh, the vulnerability of the livestock industry in Australia, uh, particularly, particularly at the moment with foot and mouth in barley, uh, is really a wake-up call, I think. It does get us thinking a little bit more acutely about what we should or could do to give ourselves a level of protection for, for the future. Foot and mouth disease and its devastating consequences has all livestock industries on high alert. Most at risk are rare breeds, few in number and with a limited gene pool. Globally, there's about 120 livestock gene banks. The USA, Germany and the Netherlands are just some of the countries with a national facility. I have been involved in uh, a couple of the roundtable discussions uh, and you know, the, I do genuinely get the impression that there's uh, a strong level of support from industry to, to make it happen. But I guess like any of these sorts of things, um, you know, where is the funding, um, who's going to supply the funding, who's going to facilitate the uh, event or the activity. 
the United Kingdom had an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in 2001. It led to the on-farm slaughter of six million cattle and sheep and highlighted how calamitous a fast-moving deadly disease could be. The UK bolstered its gene bank in the aftermath. So a livestock gene bank is insurance against other scenarios as well. Natural disasters like bushfires and floods or climate change. Australia's geographic isolation also makes us unique in other ways. In Australia, one of the things that's most important is we are a nucleus of animals that are separated largely from the rest of the world. So if a disease does happen elsewhere in the world, our reservoir of genetics, especially for the rare breeds, here is very, very important. Katie Brown and other members of the Rare Breeds Trust hope a national gene bank would store the genetics of not only rare breeds, but of every type of domestic livestock. Cattle, sheep, horses, donkeys, pigs, camels, goats, poultry and waterfowl. And this is what a gene bank might look like. Genetics Australia at Camperdown in southwest Victoria is in the heart of dairy country. Naturally, most of the genetic material stored in these cryogenic tanks is for dairy cattle. We're running just over 250 bulls on licensed semen collection. We are the largest semen collection facility in Australia, uh, producing over 1.1 million units of semen annually. Here you'll find semen from other livestock, including champion thoroughbreds from overseas, along with a range of embryos. The company sells genetics collected from its own elite animals and also collects and stores genetics for private livestock owners. It's big business. There's a burgeoning market here and abroad. The export part of our business is a really strong one. You know, we would export to over 30 countries uh, annually. You know, and I guess particularly uh, countries such as the South Americas have been really important countries uh, for our business, as has the likes of uh, South Africa. There's enough material here to breed, in theory, almost three million animals. All of it stored in a space the size of a double garage. The diversity of our livestock is clear at the Australian Sheep and Wool Show held annually in Bendigo, Victoria. The sheep pavilions have a wide array of popular breeds and some rare ones. There's at least a dozen breeds here known as heritage sheep. They all played a role in the foundation of Australia's sheep and wool industry. But since then, they've fallen out of popularity. And these days, their numbers are often really low. Some are being re-evaluated for their valuable traits. Other breeds are dwindling to oblivion. But we're only now beginning to scientifically evaluate the traits of each. For example, some have better disease resistance or are more fertile. The wool chew horn sheds its wool, so it doesn't need shearing. And just now, that's a popular trait. Brenton Hazelwood's family has been breeding English Leicesters since the 1870s. Once popular, the breed is now mostly an heirloom. Like to see English out of the wool because you can see it's envisaged that a national gene bank would accept donations of semen and embryos from livestock owners. The material would be recorded in a detailed database and stored for perpetuity. Many livestock owners already do that, with genetics stored in privately owned facilities. And where might it be located? Perhaps spread over several sites as an insurance against something like fire. The Federal Agriculture Minister's office says the proposal for a national gene bank is currently being investigated by the CSIRO, Australia's peak scientific body. Like many, Brenton Hazelwood believes a gene bank must be a federal initiative. Well, the lead has got to come from the federal government. We don't only need uh, genetic material of a breed or, or uh, a particular livestock, but we need a diversity within that breed stored. Genetics Australia is happy to play a role in a livestock gene bank. From a genetic Australia perspective, we would, you know, welcome the opportunity to be involved in assisting in the stewardship of, of such a program, you know, because we do genuinely see it as being a really important investment in the continuance of Australian livestock production. Back in central Victoria, Katie Brown has a daily uphill battle 
to preserve her rare menagerie. This stocky stallion is a highland. It originates in the Scottish Highlands, where it found favour with deer hunters, because it's strong enough to carry a big stag on its back. The Highland ponies have been in Australia since the 60s, and until 2000, they all originated from seven ponies. So very, very small gene pool. We've started breeding them in 1974, so it's dear to my heart. Um, that was probably our first experience with a rare breed. And it's slowly being rediscovered for its placid temperament and sturdy build. The breed is actually gaining popularity at the moment more than it ever has, so that's really, really heartening to see. Other rarities include this Caspian horse, a small breed whose lineage dates back at least 3,000 years. It was rediscovered in a remote part of northern Iran in the 1960s. In DNA in the Caspians, um, they've found lineages to other breeds which we thought actually came from Arab horses or something else. So they're very, very important in the family tree for horses. There's less than 1,000 Caspians left worldwide. A National Gene Bank would bring Katie Brown and others like her some peace of mind. Once it's gone, it's gone for good. So there's no coming back unless we can import them. And the countries of origin, they're in so low numbers now. So really, the animals that I've got out there, it's, they're rarer than zoo animals. Um, you know, it's pretty, pretty serious. And I think it's about time that people recognised what we have here and how important it is.